King from Sky and Dave Lewis from Tesco. You're both welcome. That's it. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. As Paul said, this session is all about serving Britain's shoppers today. The retail sector, the grocery retail sector, in a period of absolute tumult, disruptive new, new entrance to the market, the, advant the advance of digital technology, changing customer tastes, the constant demands for uh, shorter and just-in-time uh, supply chains, and of course, at the heart of it is Tesco, Britain's biggest, best-known grocery retailer, also the UK's biggest private sector employer. It employs 310,000 people. Imagine uh, getting up in the morning and thinking all of those people look to you as their leader. Dave Lewis took over the chief executive role at Tesco on the 1st of September 2014. That followed a 28-year career at Unilever, which he joined in 1987. Very distinguished period in that time. He worked in the Americas, he worked in Europe, and he worked in Asia on various Unilever roles. He was president of the Americas. His last job was as chairman of the UK and Ireland. And during that time, he's led a number of turnarounds within Unilever. No better person than to talk about what he's doing at Tesco right now. Please welcome to the stage, Dave Lewis. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Ian. Before I begin, uh, I'd like to pay tribute to John, to John Cridland, uh, for his 33 years of service to the, to the CBI. Now, given that uh, the CBI is celebrating its 50th birthday this year, that means that John has been around for about 70% of its existence which is quite a remarkable contribution, and one for which I think we should all be very, very grateful. And I suppose the fact that the eyes, in the eyes of many investors and business people around the world, uh, the fact that Britain does mean business is in, due in no small part to the work that John has done. So thank you, John. And also best of luck to Caroline as she moves into the hot seat, and to Paul as he starts as the CBI president. So now to serving Britain's shoppers a little better. As you've heard already, I'm a new boy to retailing. Just over a year, and it has been quite a year. Uh, some have commentated that it's a, been a baptism of fire, and depending on your perspective, there may be some, some truth in that. What is true is that I joined the industry at, at a very, very challenging time. Industry profitability has dropped to an historic low, and we have a unprecedented period of food deflation as well. It's great news for customers, but it's hard for a business trying to generate funds to invest and restore profitability. So in the next 13 minutes or so, what I'm going to do is try and share three things. I'll share with you my insights into the retail industry. I'll share with you some of the challenges I think we face. And finally, I'll share with you a little about what I think we can do in order to respond to these challenges. It's a remarkable industry. Let me share with you a few facts if you're not that familiar. We contribute as an industry 5% of the total GDP of the country. We employ 3 million people, which is nearly 10% of the whole workforce is in retailing in one way or another. So it's little wonder that we've often been referred to as a nation of shopkeepers. Within those figures, supermarkets alone are about 1 million direct colleagues and a further 900,000 in our supply chains. Tesco alone, as you've heard from Ian, employs 310,000 colleagues here in the UK. 54% of the women are, are women, and 70% of them are employed in very flexible employment arrangements. And every year, as an industry, we pay somewhere in the region of 28 billion in tax. So it's big. I think I knew that. I suspect you knew that. But what I didn't appreciate until I was actually sitting in this role was some of the other contributions that the retail sector makes. Social mobility. I didn't know before I did this job that 69% of the stores and 72% of our sales are outside the southeast and London. It's more evenly spread geographically uh, than either financial services or manufacturing. In terms of training and development, I didn't know that 
of 16 and 17 year olds work in retail. It's a very valuable first experience of working life. I didn't know that 15% of all apprenticeships are in retail. And what's more, the industry spends about 1,500 pounds in training and development on every colleague every year. It's an industry that puts a lot of time and a lot of effort into the development of a large portion of the active workforce. It's also very, very, very prominent in local community. The industry contributes a lot at every level. If I share with you what we do in Tesco, we donate around 4% of our pre-tax profits to charity. Uh, we have so far since we started donated something approaching 30 million meals to people in need. And we have a community project in virtually every store that we operate. All the proceeds from the bag charge that you would have heard of, which in our case is about 30 million pounds, will go to local community projects. And nationally, we continue to support Diabetes UK, British Heart Foundation, and indeed cancer research in our long sponsorship of the Race for Life. So a big industry with lots and lots of touch points. So then to the challenges that we face. Some of these are well known and well documented. The first one that everyone talks about, and quite rightly, is the growth of digital. Next year, the global internet economy will be something north of $4 trillion, delivering a revolution in connectivity, data sharing, and analytics. Increasingly, the world is mobile. You know, major online retailers uh, report that more than half of UK transactions now take place on a smart device. And in the UK, digital retailing has doubled over the last five years to become north of a 10 billion business. As a business, we expect this to continue growing. The challenge for us is how do we make our online businesses tomorrow <clears throat> as profitable as our offline businesses of yesterday? But I would share with you, I think there's a challenge at a national level. Digital operations have fewer a, a, a smaller community footprint. They have far fewer employees and a far lower tax contribution. That should be a dilemma for the exchequer because without rebalancing to reflect digital business models, the physical side of retail pays a higher and higher proportion of the tax bill. Furthermore, it possibly incentivizes a, sh a swifter shift to infrastructure light, low employment businesses with little interaction with communities. For my second challenge, we come back to the physical world. And a lot is talked about the growth of limited range retailers and a growth of convenient shopping. Both have affected profitability and indeed growth. It's true, limited range retailing is growing. It's also doubled over the last five years and will be worth somewhere around 13 billion pounds this next year. Shopping habits changed during the recession, basket sizes were reduced, weekly shops were split into multiple shopping occasions. As a result, the convenience channel has grown again 5% this year. And our big stores are now more and more visited. In fact, on 76% 76 of occasions, they are actually visited for a convenience shopping trip. But actually, I don't see that so much as a challenge. I just see it uh, as a shift in what customers want and need from us. And our job as business leaders is to adapt and change to that. What I do see as a challenge for the industry coming to it afresh is that whilst the customer was heading in that direction, we were heading in another. Um, between 2007 and 2014, we added something around 35 million square foot of new selling space. To size that for you, that's about twice the equivalent size of Asda today. And the fact that that happened in a market that didn't grow inevitably meant that it couldn't go on. The returns on investment fell very markedly. And in January of this year, we called a halt. It was painful. Colleagues and communities were affected as we closed stores and decided to halt construction on others. I suspect, however, that other competitors were relieved because shortly afterwards they announced similar plans of their own. But it wasn't just the big four that always get the news. More independent shops were closed than opened in the first six months of this year. And that's the first time that's happened for many years. Now, as the first CEO in Tesco's history to be criticized for not opening a shop or for closing some existing stores, I can tell you this trend you're seeing now is no longer down to us. Which brings me to what I consider to be the real challenge for our industry as we sit here today. 
And that is, put simply, the addition of more structural cost at a time of historically low <coughs> profitability. I've spoken already about deflation. Two years ago, food inflation was running at plus 4%. Year to date, it's minus 2.4%. It's great news for the customer, but definitely very significant pressure for parts of the retail industry. In supermarkets alone, profitability has shrunk from 5% to 2% in five years, and we now face some very significant structural new cost pressure. And this is a potentially lethal cocktail. Business rates, it's complex, really complex, and only the most dogged commentators follow it. Uh, but let me spell out a few simple facts for you. Over the last five years, property values have fallen. Profits are down, but business rates are up, quietly but dramatically. Business rates have hit eight billion pounds for retail. That's over a quarter of the bill and significantly more than any other sector. That's an enormous pressure. Shops have closed. Businesses have lost and jobs have been sacrificed. At Tesco, our own business rates have increased by well over 35% in the last five years. It's the biggest tax we pay, and it's now three times the OECD average. A lot is made of the reductions in corporation tax, and like you, we are welcoming of that. But for every one pound, for every one pound we pay in corporation tax, large UK retailers pay £2.31 in business rates. It's unsustainable and it needs review. No doubt you're also familiar with the national living wage. Now the debate around pay is really important. Our colleagues are the greatest assets we have. Their quality, their unrelenting commitment and their passion for doing the right thing are at the heart of the business turnaround that we're trying to lead. Now, notwithstanding the challenge that we face in this very particular year, at Tesco, we have a good history of paying well. And we were supportive of the living wage when it was, in, uh, when it was announced. And our pay and our benefits package today is already significantly above the new voluntary living wage rate. If you monetize benefits, for example, and if I give you an example outside of London, we already rate at £8.80 an hour. Our concern, and the concern of many of our colleagues, is that there is a pressure to increase base pay at the expense of benefits. We don't think that that's the simple answer. We wouldn't and shouldn't simply strip down employment to an hourly rate or draw arbitrary, arbitrary lines. Excuse me. It's more complex than that. Benefits are hugely important to our colleagues, and they're valuable too. Our workforce is not homogenous. Our colleagues say they value different things at different stages in their lives, and at Tesco, what we're trying to do is accommodate that. We need a fuller debate aimed at doing the right thing for the people in our industry without imposing more cost, without providing individual benefit or business return. At Tesco, we're working on a menu of benefits which give colleagues flexibility of choice and support which they value, including a competitive pension scheme, a turnaround bonus, colleague discount, the opportunity to invest in our business through save as you earn. And in a, at an industry level, I think there is a concern that the unintended consequences of the living wage have not yet been fully thought through. So if those are the challenges, how should we respond? At Tesco, we face these industry problems, and dare I say it, some others of our own making as well. When challenged by the economic reality, we inflicted damage on our business in pursuit of maintaining a level of profitability which was unsustainable given the environment in which we were operating. What we've done, what we try to do, is take stock, to consult with key stakeholders openly, to use our ears, not our mouths. We've sought to seek collaboration in addressing the challenges and opportunities that we face, and we're looking to cooperate with partners as we chart our course in the journey of turning our business around. It will take time, but we will build on this collaboration, finding common goals rather than imposing unilateral decisions. And I suppose it's there that I'd aspire for us to get to with government. I'd like to find a way to be constructive uh, and open-minded on all sides, based on more consultation, collaboration, and cooperation. Getting this right has huge consequences for the retail industry, but also for the wider economy, for social mobility, geographical balance, training, and for employment more broadly. 
I believe government needs to be careful and strategic on regulation and taxation, recognizing the changing dynamics, taking account of these new realities, consulting to iron out un unintended consequences, with the ultimate prize being greater stability, sustainable growth, and a better deal for taxpayers. The challenge I described earlier create an opportunity and an imperative for government and business to share knowledge, innovation, and risk in tackling some of the more pressing issues we face as a country. But it requires collaboration as well as tax collection. I've always considered myself to be a bit of an optimist. So whilst I talk about these significant challenges, I also see real opportunities. If we can meet in the middle ground, we can solve problems together. We can forge partnerships which drive progress on health, training, skills. We can create economic growth while protecting families and communities where they live, achieve sensible regulation and a new balance of taxation and incentives. But if we can't consult effectively or find better ways of working, I fear that it's the communities all over Britain that will suffer. I'd like to see the retail industry, Tesco very much involved in that, working closely with government on three things. Firstly, I'd encourage the industry and government to sit down at the highest level, consult on the multiple policy changes that are affecting the industry, to share together the consequences of higher rates, the living wage, and initiatives such as the apprenticeship levy. The British Retail Consortium is already attempting to do that, but it's important that it takes two to tango. Secondly, I'd like us to be able to innovate together on tough employment skills and training challenges. The opportunity for government is to enable us to continue offering personal mobility through training, development, and progression. We can do the heavy lifting from no skills to some skills. To continue offering crucial flexibility to enable mums and older workers to return to work in very large numbers. Let's not constrain ourselves after a decade of progress creating 5,000 jobs for the long-term unemployed in locations from Corby to Woolwich through our Regeneration Partnership Scheme or to choke the progress that's created 9,500 apprenticeships between 2012 and 2014. Employers like us can be innovators on tough agendas, sharing the burden of government priority. But a balance has to be struck between allowing investment for growth and collecting taxes through mecha mechanisms like the apprenticeship levy, which wipes out the equivalent of our entire training budget. The third area where I see real potential for partnership and innovation is on health and food education. We estimate that our work together on reducing salt has saved around 1,500 lives, proof that when industry and government do work together, we can make a real, real difference. Millions of Britain shoppers are weekly Tesco customers. We have a little bit more than 40 million transactions a week. And when we reformulate, we can remove billions of calories from the shopping trip. In soft drinks, our actions remove sugar. We've reorganized aisles, increased the number of low and no calorie options. And four years on, the average customer is now buying 20% less sugar in soft drinks. This year, we removed sweets, fizzy drinks, and crisps from checkouts in smaller stores. And this month, the one millionth child embarks on a farm to fork trial to improve basic understanding of food. That's 179 farms around uh, the country. It's nearly 800 stores and 800 communities where we've been actively involved in raising the e education around food. We make large-scale contributions to heart health, cancer research, and the fight against diabetes. And this year, as you can probably tell, we're also supporting Movember. <laughs> you can spot the Tesco people around the room. Everybody is growing, growing their stubble. These are just some of the health initiatives, but there are many more. We were a founding signatory to the Public Health Responsibility Deal. We signed 27 pledges covering food, alcohol, physical activity, and health at work. Direct action on agendas shared with government, delivering outcomes that government struggles to deliver at scale. I want to partner and innovate more on health, not because I want to burnish Tesco's image, but because two-thirds of supermarket shoppers want me to be because it's about Tesco serving Britain shoppers a little better every day. That's why we want to be able to increase our social and economic contribution across employment, employability, training, and skills development, because we believe it is good for our colleagues, our customers, and the communities where they live.
That's why we want to increase our social and economic contribution through health initiatives. We're uniquely placed to nudge millions of people every week towards healthier choices. Our customers want it, and the government can benefit greatly from it if we meet in the middle ground. Nurturing growth, social value alongside economic value in an era of extraordinary change needs a new level of collaboration, a new way. A new way with our colleagues inside the business, with our suppliers, between business and government, based on mutual benefit and shared risk, incentivized investment in ideas and action, all within a rebalanced, growth-minded tax framework with a mindful, which is mindful of the unintended consequences and actually reflects very real pressures on business right now as they navigate unprecedented change. We need a new way of working for a rapidly changing world, a new way to solve more of the problems people want us to solve more quickly and at lower cost to taxpayers. That's good for business, good for government, and given the wider economic importance of retail, good for Britain as a whole. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. So you've been CEO for just over a year. You walked into an absolute hurricane. Is it getting any easier? Um, yes, I think it is. I think you know, the challenges of the business are still very much there. But I'm delighted with the progress that we've made in some quite challenging um, environment. You know, I've been really amazed by just the quality and the commitment of the 310,000 people that I've encountered in Tesco. And so whilst we faced into some really very difficult decisions we've had to make, people have done so really, you know, with a huge amount of commitment and an unbelievable amount of understanding. So steady as it goes, but it's a big ship, so we need to, you know, be patient as we turn it around. Yeah, you outlined some of the challenges that the whole sector faces, not just Tesco notably food deflation, mm -hmm. decreasing profitability. When do you anticipate any of that changing? <laughs> well, look, you know, if you're, if you're following the commodity market, you would see that actually most crops have been uh, quite healthy through this year. So uh, we look at food deflation and say we don't see it changing in the very near term. In addition to that, we know as Tesco that we need to invest some more. So the idea that prices stay negative for the very immediate future is something that we... Uh, would build into our plans. It's not great news for shareholders, but it is pretty good news for, uh, for customers in that sense. But of course, I mean, if, you were at bus if, if this were a business school lecture and you'd say, well, if you're not selling more stuff, then the only way to increase or sustain profits is to cut costs in the short term. Yeah, and the combination, as you know, in Tesco is we've been doing both. We've, we've had to address some pretty significant challenges around reducing our costs. Uh, but what we've tried to do is uh, allow greater leverage from that lower cost by increasing the volume that we sell. And that's been about investing in price in order that we try and get both benefits, increasing the volume and lowering the cost in order to regenerate that profitability that was always a big part of the Tesco business model. Yeah, I mean, you said during your speech there that Tesco's previous business model wasn't sustainable. I think I saw another quote that you, where you said, commercial income driven by profit focus had clouded our purpose. Basically, you're having to embark on a root and branch reform of Tesco's culture? Well, I think it's, it's partly the business model and it is partly the culture. I think the one thing that we have is we have a very strong culture in terms of a performance ethic. Uh, I think the challenge and the responsibility for someone like me is that I point all of that capability and that passion in the right direction. And I think, you know, it's not, it's not unreasonable that people who were in that situation were trying to deal with the external environment and maintain the level of profitability. But sometimes the external environment changes so much that you need to have the space to step back and say, do you know what? We do need to reset and rebuild. And, and that's not what happened, and that's what we're having to do now. Yeah, and I suspect all the reporters in the room, their ears would have pricked up at some of the comments you made about business rates, mm -hmm. for example. Realistically, is the government going to change tack on this? Well, I, I, I don't honestly know. You know I, I thought I'd share a perspective, which is if I come to the industry completely afresh, I think I look at the history in this particular area and just how significant it is as a cost on this industry, and I just ask myself some questions, which is, why is it the level that it is? You know, it's three times the OECD average. You know, 
against what it is we contribute to both the economy, to the taxation, it's completely disproportionate in this one area. It has no representation in gross value add or indeed what's happened in terms of the pro So it just, you know, I come to it, I'm completely fresh. I've not grown up in the retail area, but I look at the business rates and say, we need to be really careful because if this carries on, don't be, don't be surprised that the impact of that sort of cost base, given what I've to talked about in terms of the industry context, will have quite, quite meaningful impact. Mm. Are you not encouraged by the fact that the Chancellor, though, seems to be wanting local authorities to take on more responsibility? He's obviously trying to inculcate competition among local authorities to actually bear down on rates rather than push them up. I think that's right. And, you know, we would welcome, we still need to understand exactly how that works. But I think if you run a business like mine, which is truly, truly national, the thing that I'll have to balance is actually how do I deal with lots and lots of local authorities as opposed to having one clear way in which I can run a business, which is, you know, literally we have a store in every postcode in the UK bar one. So mm. I don't really want to have too much sort of region by region negotiation because that, you know, could de deflect us in a different way. Yeah, I remember your predecessor but once actually telling me what a job that was. I mentioned one particular local authority and he said, always been a tricky one, that one. Is that right? <laughs> well, I haven't had that experience myself, so I shouldn't, shouldn't comment. And look, we don't know, Ian, what it will, will take. I suppose I just wanted to point to the fact that if you put together business rates, movement on living wage, some of the other costs that are coming which are structural, if you put all of that together, I think the you know, British Retail Consortium are saying at least 14 billion of extra cost for the sector in the next five years. Yeah. That, that cost won't come without some impact. There aren't many uh, other sectors facing that sort of uh, cost. No, indeed. And, and I mean, maybe, at the risk of sounding brutal, maybe you do need to start shutting more stores to, I mean, politi you know, Sajid Javid's over in Brussels today, pleading the case of the British steel industry. What, what do you think it takes to get ministers to sit up and listen sometimes? Well, look, I, th I think I, you know, we made some difficult decisions uh, a few months ago, uh, earlier in this year, to close stores that we, do, we knew that there was never a way of making them profitable. So we've been able to support those because of profit elsewhere in the business. We couldn't do that given the situation of making, remember, in the second half of last year, Tesco in the UK made no profit whatsoever, right? So we couldn't see our way clear to doing that. We've kept all the stores that we think if we improve our business in the way that we would hope that they have a future as part of it. And look, for Tesco, we want to provide stores in communities across the UK. So I'm not going to make the business better by closing more and more stores. I need to try and make an environment in which actually these stores can prosper. And that's why I'm trying to just open out the debate a little bit so that we can think about it. Because look, I can say this, I'm a new boy. The impact of retail in our wider economy in terms of its touch, and I tried to give some examples there, is absolutely massive, unlike any I've ever experienced. And we just need to be careful that we don't lose some of that or damage some of that, you know, almost by accident, if you like, if we don't think through all of the consequences of what we do. But if I've heard you correctly, what you were saying just then was that you'd like to see all of the grocery retailers adopting this collaborative approach with government. It's not, it's not just down to Tesco, you want to see no. everyone else. Is that? Is that practical, though? I mean, you're in this ferociously competitive environment where you're all at each other's throats 24-7. Well, I don't think we're going to compete on, on what the policy is on, on business rates. I think we'll compete in terms of how well it is we satisfy customers, which is exactly right. I think, that, look, the BRC has reached out and continues to reach out and can represent the retail industry uh, in order to have that sort of meaningful dialogue. So the, the bodies exist to actually engage we just need to engage in a way that puts all of these things together, because otherwise they may not be, they may not be linked. But I mean, you, you expressed frustration there at the way in which the living wage is reported, for example. I mean, I've had conversations with some of your peers, and they agree with that. But is it realistic to expect the likes of Aldi and Lidl to, to sign up for the same agenda that, for example, you and Sainsbury's might be trying to pursue on this? But, but I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't propose that. I really wouldn't propose that. I think all we're proposing is, if you do, just very, you know, for years and years and years, people that came before me have worked with 300,000 colleagues to build a benefits package, which was exactly what colleagues wanted, given their stage in life and how it is they wanted to work with a business like ours. I think as long as we are a little bit broader in the way that we look at the total investment in our colleague reward, then we're fine. The fact that we choose to offer benefits which our colleagues value is part of our decision. If our competitors choose not to, then that's, 
part of that. So I'm not looking for, I'm just looking for a more balanced view about how it is we look about the, the investment. And as I say, in Tesco, what we're looking to do is give colleagues the choice. We're basically going to give them the menu of everything we give them and give them the option about whether they want to take the benefit or monetize that and take it. And that's about recognizing the different lifestyle. But I just, I just want us to have a fuller conversation and not just reducing this down to an hourly rate. Mm. It, it's simple, but perhaps too simple. And as you say, the, the apprenticeship levy potentially is an enormous burden on the business. Do it, again, do it. How realistic is it that the government's well, going to... I suppose this is where, and again, I can say this because I wasn't, wasn't part of it, I think the retail industry in Tesco have done a fantastic job in terms of driving apprenticeships. You know, I, I said, you know, 15% of all apprenticeships that are out there are in the retail sector. We invest £1,500 per colleague per year on training and development. And, and so the track record is, is fantastic. We just need to be careful that in driving the levy, we don't actually take away the funds which we're using to, to actually do quite a good job in retail against what is ostensibly the same objective. Yeah. Well, we're right out of time. Busy time for you coming up for Christmas. Is it going to be a better one than last year? <laughs> uh, perennial question. Look, we're in, we're in good shape. The business has improved through most of this year. You know, given you've asked me the question, we, we have to anniversary some things that I wouldn't want us to repeat, so we'll just hold our nerve and walk through that. Um, but, um, yeah, no, the, the, I, was, I was out last week, and we look in good shape, so I'll keep my fingers crossed. Very good. Well, best of luck for that. Ladies and gentlemen, please show your appreciation to Dave Lewis. Great stuff. Thank you. Thank you.